My name is Karen Tchaikovsky. I'm from Brigham Women's Hospital. And the first speaker would be Dr. Len Zahn from Children's Hospital, who'll be talking about a zebrafish as a, a model for human cancer and therapeutic development. Len? Great. Well, it's uh, really a pleasure uh, to be here, and thanks for coming back from lunch, even though we started a little bit late. Um, I've really enjoyed this conference. It's a uh, really an, a great intersection of uh, science and medicine, and so great job, uh, Bruce, definitely putting it together. And I'm going to teach you all about zebrafish genetics. Uh, so <clears throat> let's uh, think about uh, cancer in a developmental context. Uh, you know, we all have think about uh, stem cells and how it may relate uh, to uh, cancer biology and how um, embryogenesis is certainly uh, a, a period of time when uh, cells are growing and differentiating. And so if you look, um, is there a pointer at all or not really? Red, Red thing? Okay, great, perfect. Excellent. So if you look at a human embryo at 28 days and a zebrafish embryo at 19 hours, you can see that they're very similar in their um, development, and uh, if you think about developmental pathways that are involved in how this uh, embryos are put together, notch, win, and BMP, that's certainly involved in cancer, uh, as been demonstrated by uh, somatic mutations. And so, um, really, the zebrafish has an attribute of being able to uh, study cancer in some unique angles just from a developmental context. Um, but the other part about zebrafish is that you can make a lot of them. So every mother has 200 to 300 babies every week. And uh, we've recently uh, made a new tank uh, called the iSpawn, and we can get about 10,000 embryos in 10 minutes. So uh, it's almost at the level that we'll be able to scale this up to screen equivalent to a cell line screen. And um, I'm going to talk almost all uh, about uh, chemicals. And so you can put embryos into uh, 96 well plates, and you can have libraries of chemicals and add them to these wells, and then screen for chemicals that could affect uh, signaling pathways during embryogenesis. And this may have something to do with uh, cancer in adulthood. And uh, there's um, uh, time-lapse uh, video microscopy that you can do. Um, there's some microfluidics that is available for zebrafish. And then uh, we have fish that are transgenic fish that have green organs, and so you can screen uh, for particular developmental pathways or in situ hybridization, uh, which is to look at where the RNA is ex expressed or antibodies. So um, actually, just before this talk, Bruce said, you really need to solve the RAS problem. So um, we're trying, I would say, that we don't have a major hit, but I want to tell you about how we're going about it. So um, Dave Langenau uh, in my lab, uh, now he's at Mass General, had uh, found that if you overexpress KRAS um, in a specific muscle compartment during embryogenesis, you get uh, fish that have rhabdomyosarcomas. And he was able to take these rhabdomyosarcomas, and uh, we made uh, Affymetrix chips from fish. We call these fission chips. And uh, we were able to uh, do microarrays, and we were able to show, uh, very similar to what Tyler has shown, that there's a RAS signature. Um, and our signature and Tyler's signature is very, very similar to each other. And um, we then wanted to see if this was relevant to development, and we had a fish that has the heat shock promoter driving uh, HRAS. And so you could heat up the fish, and RAS would get activated. And um, we took some of the genes from our RAS signature, and uh, we studied their expression in the presence of this heat, um, so it would be activating RAS. And we found a number of genes that are significantly upregulated. And then, as I said, zebrafish are a great chemical biology system, so we incubated um, those in a pan-RAF inhibitor, and most of those were specifically down-regulated. And one of the ones that struck us is this uh, DUS6 gene, which uh, was tremendously activated at a transcriptional level and then was uh, suppressed by um, a, a, a RAF inhibitor. So um, what is DUS6? So it's a transcriptional target, and it's also a negative regulator of the RASMAP kinase pathway. It's a dual specificity phosphatase uh, 6, and um, it functions to dephosphorylate MAP kinase kind of as a negative regulator. So MAP kinase gets activated, this thing gets activated, it then stops the pathway from working. And so if we take our um, heat shock fish, and here's no heat shock, but then if we heat them up, you can see all throughout the entire embryo, uh, DUSP6 is transcriptionally activated. So this gives us a, a model to actually um, do a screen. 
So the screen that we've undertaken is to take a uh, heat shock uh, RAS line and we heat it up. Um, and normally what would happen is this gives a burst of expression of RAS and then uh, you'll follow this by a burst of expression of DUSP6 and the screen will be to look for uh, chemicals that interfere with DUSP6 expression. And you would expect that this would get uh, typical MAP kinase inhibitors or it would also get heat shock or transcriptional inactivators and we were able to rule those out. Okay, so um, we were able to screen uh, 2,500 chemicals of known action and then added in a variety of other chemicals from uh, libraries uh, that we had available to us. And basically, we have categories of expression. So essentially, um, a level three uh, hit is what a normal fish would look like. We found some chemicals that activate the MAP kinase pathway, and we found other chemicals that will be inhibited. So these are the chemicals that we found. We found 18 chemicals that are confirmed suppressors of HRAS. And it's really true. I mean, they're very robust, and they are completely suppressed. Um, and these are a list of the chemicals, and it's not too surprising that a number of these are MAP kinase uh, inhibitors and other chemicals. But as you might expect, it's almost uh, too many things because not all of these would actually block cancer. And so we wanted to use the zebrafish to see if we could um, block cancer. So we return to uh, uh, Dave's uh, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma model, and I just want to tell you a little bit about this model. You basically inject KRAS into a one-cell embryo, and seven days later you have cancer. So it's a very, very fast assay. And um, you can see this, uh, a lot of the fish die. And um, Dave also developed a co-injection technique. So if you just co-inject two plasmids, one with KRAS and one with red, then all the tumors will actually be red. So uh, Juning Li, a graduate student in the lab, developed this assay where essentially she started looking at the tumors at day seven. And then she measured the growth on day 10 and day 13 uh, using microscopy for the red color. And over here you can see the growth of the tumor um, again in uh, day seven and then in green uh, day 10 and then day 13 would be the, um, in yellow. So this worked incredibly well, and we're able to monitor the growth of these tumors. And so she then tested each of the 18 chemicals to see which would inhibit the tumor. And uh, really only two of them do this. Uh, one of them is an anti-MAP kinase chemical, and the other I'll talk about. So um, this is, uh, again, the MAP kinase inhibitor, and you can see the growth rates uh, being suppressed uh, with this uh, PD drug. And um, we also look at the length of the uh, fish and make sure that that's not suppressed by this, uh, um, so it's not just a complete anti-proliferative effect. And I think this is uh, very similar to work by Tyler where he found a chemical that would inhibit KRAS-induced intestinal hyperplasia. And so I think that the message is very similar that if you can find chemicals that block the MAP kinase pathway, uh, this would be very helpful. Well, this um, TPCK uh, chemical also uh, specifically slows growth and doesn't slow the growth of the fish. And so um, this one was pretty interesting because um, it was originally designed as a protease inhibitor. And it's known that topically applied TPCK was shown to inhibit tumor initiation in a mouse skin tumor model that was induced by DMBA. Um, and it specifically inhibits S6 kinase based on some of the work that was done by John Blennis' lab, but not MEK or AKT. And uh, we were able to take zebrafish embryos and actually grind them up. And again, uh, similarly, you can see the PD drug will inhibit MAP kinase, and this TPCK will not inhibit MAP kinase or AKT, but specifically inhibits the phosphorylation, um, the S6 kinase uh, phosphorylation step. So one of the questions we had is what would happen if you combine the MAP kinase inhibitor and this TPCK? And uh, we can basically, at a, at a certain dose regimen, show that uh, synergistically they actually will, um, will suppress tumor growth. And you can see here, compared to a control, how the tumor growth is actually uh, suppressed. This TPCK was, there was some attempts to actually get it into the clinic, and unfortunately it failed because of the toxicity profile. Uh, but nevertheless, it has a unique activity in this S1 kinase, and it's probably a little bit downstream of, of mTOR. 
So I'm not going to go into the mechanistic studies of this, but, and I just wanted to use it as an illustration, but you know, uh, we've seen this diagram so many times in this meeting, it's, uh, but simply by inhibiting MEC and in inhibiting the other pathways, I think that the synergism will uh, be very valuable. And this assay can be used to study really any uh, set of chemicals. So I think that uh, the fish has a role now, uh, perhaps in, uh, in pre-screening your drugs if you have too many that you wanna, don't want to do mice. Okay, now what I'd like to do is to uh, switch and tell you about a model that we have for uh, melanoma in the lab and also a new drug that we've discovered that we think is uh, interesting for treatment of melanoma. Um, so in this uh, melanoma model, what we did is we took a V600E human BRAF and we injected it into fish. And um, when we do that, um, we get a very um, dark fish, but none of the fish ever get melanoma. But if we inject this into a P53 mutant fish, then all the fish get melanoma. And we've done uh, microarrays on this uh, fish, uh, melanoma, and it looks very similar to human melanoma. So Rich White, who's a uh, Hemonc fellow, um, who's in the lab, uh, was looking at the embryos for these different genotypes. And um, there is a set of embryonic melanocytes and what's surprising is, uh, even though this fish is mutated in P53 and it's activated BRAF in all of its melanocytes, it has a normal number of melanocytes. And uh, this was quite surprising to Rich, and he said, I think there's something wrong with this fish, it's just that we don't know what it is. So he decided to take these embryos and do microarrays. And um, what he was able to find, again, was a set of genes that are specifically upregulated in the BRAF P53 combination. And so this turned out to be about 377 genes or so. And then what he did was um, to take um, the zebrafish melanomas and find a set of genes that were specific to the zebrafish melanomas and did an overlap of these two uh, circles, which produced a 123 gene, uh, gene uh, signature, which predicts which embryos are gonna get adult melanoma, which is uh, quite interesting. And when he looked at the list of these genes, they were almost all neural crest progenitor genes. So this includes a gene called Crestin, SOX10, EDNRB, the endothelial and B receptor, um, and also a few melanocyte uh, genes. So um, this set up a model uh, that he wanted to see what was going on during embryogenesis. And we have this marker in zebrafish called Crestin, and uh, this marks the entire neural crest. And what you can see here is that this fish has extra neural crest cells. You can see in the head and the cells that are coming down over the brain, there's more cells that are coming down. And then later, at about 72 hours of development, um, only in this genotype, you can see these extra rests of cells. And so he developed a model where basically maybe this cell is the precursor of the melanoma. And so perhaps you could think of melanoma as a stem cell disease and that you have an extra set of progenitors. This might give you a higher chance for during replication to basically get mutations. And so it could be true that in fair-skinned individuals, they just have a higher pool of, uh, of stem cells. Well, we went on with Scott Granter um, to look at uh, human melanomas, and there's a lot of neural crest genes that are expressed in human melanomas. Um, this includes the endothelin B receptors and endothelin itself and also SOX10. So we're seeing um, a large subset of melanomas that actually express the neural crest progenitor uh, genes that he had found in his uh, assay. So then what Rich said is, well, if neural crest progenitors are expanded in melanoma, um, perhaps uh, I should look for a drug that gets rid of the neural crest. And maybe that would be a new treatment for melanoma. So what this would represent is something that attacks the cell fate of the cancer. Okay, so it's a little bit different than attacking the signaling, uh, but it's the fate of the tumor. Okay, so what he did is he took uh, wild-type zebrafish, put them into wells, <coughs> and now we've got our robotic in situ hybridization for Crestin. So you basically look for a fish that doesn't have any neural crest cells. So he found one chemical that completely erased the neural crest, okay? And it was this chemical here, 
and it was a novel structure. We had no idea what it was. And luckily, there are some new chemoinformatic databases, um, particularly one from UCSF. And we actually put it in, and it said that this chemical is a dihydroorotate dehydrogenase inhibitor. Now, I have to say, um, I did go to medical school. I never heard of this enzyme. Um, but <laughs> but um, what is true is um, <coughs> there's a drug which is FDA approved for arthritis called leflunamide. And leflunamide is a DHODH inhibitor, and it has no structural similarity to our uh, chemical. Uh, but we decided to test leflunamide, and it also um, completely erases the neural crest. So um, DHODH had never been implicated in vivo um, <coughs> for neural crest development. And I, I'll tell you later that this is the, uh, one of the enzymes that's involved in producing uridine. And so it's a very strange result that you would have such a specific finding in the absence of uh, uridine. OK, we wanted to find out if this affected mammalian neural crest uh, development. And we worked with uh, Jack Mosher, who's in Sean Morrison's lab. And Sean is one of the world's experts in neural crest stem cells. And he can grow these uh, neural crest spheres. And uh, basically, we plated them uh, with and without leflunamide now, because we just decided to use that as our chemical, and then evaluated secondary neurosphere assays as a role of uh, looking at self-renewal. And what we see here is that um, leflunamide in a dose-dependent uh, uh, inhibition of self-renewal. So it's clear that this chemical can affect uh, mammalian cells uh, also, and specifically in the neural crest. OK, now, um, again, for some biochemistry for all of you, um, we have the CAD DHODH pathway. OK, so you have CAD which is an enzyme also I didn't hear about. And then it eventually goes to DHODH as you make uh, uridine. And uh, this is actually a highly regulated pathway. So actually, if you look on your microarrays, I bet a lot of in cancer that this is a highly regulated pathway. Um, but it's certainly relatively ubiquitous. And for a while, Rich and I were questioning each other about whether to take the project even forward, because it's hard to know how uridine would be involved in neural crest development. But we were helped by two observations. Um, so the first is that there's actually a zebrafish mutant called perplex. It's called perplex because it doesn't have a jaw. And uh, it has defects in craniofacial cartilage and small eyes. And so that was very exciting because it gave us some uh, feeling that this were true. But nothing was better than um, when this paper came out, I think, in January. So it turns out that in, um, they needed a case to do exome sequencing of the human genome. And so the first time that anybody's ever cloned a mutation from a novel disease using exome sequencing was for Miller syndrome. <clears throat> and when they sequenced Miller syndrome, who has craniofacial cartilage, small eyes, and coloboma, all neural crest defects, um, you basically uh, found it was mutated in DHODH. So clearly, what we had found is related to the human uh, condition. So, we felt that what we were doing was relevant, and uh, the problem was you needed to know how this worked. And I had a model which uh, was based on UDP-dependent glycosylation. You may know that neural crest cells need to migrate. It's known in some literature that they have specific UDP glycnac, UDP glucose, all those things are used for migration. And Rich tried to phenocopy uh, this uh, effect with some uh, glycosylases and things, and nothing would work. Um, but um, and he tried some DNA replication agents, also didn't give an absence of neural crest. And so he found one paper in the literature which had an effect of uridine on transcription. And uh, that was uh, this paper from uh, 1997, um, which is that you need uridine to have your transcription elongation to occur. So transcription starts with initiates, and then it pauses for a little bit, and then it needs to elongate. And it's this elongation step that requires uridine. And in this paper, you could actually take an elongation factor called SPT5 and add it in vitro to the reaction, and now you would have a rescue of elongation. So it seems that this would regulate transcriptional elongation. So this SPT5 is an interesting factor. It's also known as DSIF. And DSIF is the pausing factor. But then there's a kinase that comes in, which is called PTFB. And PTFB will phosphorylate the pausing factor and the polymerase. And this will allow the elongation step to occur. And I think this is a great 
uh, place to think about cancer therapeutics, actually, at this elongation step. So in our lab, for another project, we happened to have an SPT5 null mutant. And so we stained it for neural crest, and it has no neural crest. And we actually uh, went to the trouble of doing microarrays on our leflunamide-treated embryos and the SPT5 uh, null allele, and they are exact phenocopies of each other. So you can see here that there were, in the leflunamide, 223 genes down, 183 of those genes were found in the SPT5, and then even the genes that are up are of a shared overlap. Now, luckily, zebrafish is a genetic system, so you could look for genetic interactions with the drug. And so um, we have in our lab a hypomorphic allele of SPT5. And you can see that compared to wild types, um, it's a little hypopigmented, but not too bad. Um, but if you add leflunamide, you can convert this to an animal that has no neural crest, demonstrating genetic interaction. And if you look at the charts here, um, in a wild type or heterozygote, there's no uh, pigmentation phenotype, but in the mutants, there's a, a light phenotype. But essentially, in a dose-dependent uh, reaction with leflutamide, you can convert either the mutant to stop having neural crest, or even the heterozygote now will stop having neural crest if you give this chemical. We wanted to demonstrate that transcription elongation was uh, actually being regulated, and um, our first way of doing this was to actually um, make primers towards the 5' prime end and the 3' prime end of the cDNA. And what we found is that a gene like MITF, which is the master regulator of the melanocyte lineage, does not elongate. And what's strange about it, and we don't understand why, is um, all neural crest genes will not elongate and all notch genes will not elongate, but everything else elongates fine. So there's some specificity to this that we don't quite understand, um, but it's interesting. So then um, we wanted to see how global this was, and we collaborated with, um, with uh, Pete Rawl and, and Charles Lynn with um, Rick Young's lab who's one of the pioneers in, uh, in this uh, transcription elongation field. And uh, this was an amazing experiment. We actually did CHIP-seq in human melanoma cells. These are two independent human melanoma cells um, with um, a POL2 antibody. And what happens is, is that this is a typical gene, and so normally you have initiation and then you would elongate. But you can see here for many, many genes that um, the elongation doesn't happen. So um, it really demonstrates across the genome that uh, some genes are not elongating. And then we wanted to find out what are those genes that aren't elongating. And it turns out that most of those genes are MYC targets. Um, and so um, this interactome is, uh, is demonstrating um, that these factors are bound by MYC. And uh, this was interesting because Rick had had a paper that MYC actually regulates transcription pause release. And so it's one of the major factors that's a, uh, that is regulating in cancer these elong and in embryonic stem cells this, uh, this elongation effect. So um, with all that, we decided to um, see um, if these um, chemicals uh, would work. So leflunamide on its own actually is a pretty good anti-melanoma drug. Um, <clears throat> But we also tested it with the Plexicon drug, that's the V600E drug that's in uh, trial, and you can see clear synergy in three different uh, human melanoma cells. And so then we decided to do xenografts, and uh, what we can see here is that um, at a certain dose, the Plexicon drug will have an effect, um, leflunamide will also have an effect, and the two together, uh, shown here, uh, have a substantial inhibition of uh, tumor growth. So we think this is an interesting uh, drug that actually is an FDA-approved drug that might be able to be put into the clinic. And if you think about it, um, the Plexicon drug is probably affecting cell proliferation, and the uh, leflunamide is attacking the fate of the actual melanoma cell. And so the two of them together might be uh, an interesting combination. So. Um, just uh, in closing, I hope I've convinced you that zebrafish chemical genetics is a high-throughput way of finding inhibitors of uh, neural crest lineages in vivo. Um, we think we have a new role for transcription elongation in the development of the neural crest, and uh, that this inhibition of DHODH blocks neural crest development and cooperates with BRAF blockade to abrogate uh, melanoma growth. 
And I just want to thank the people who've done the work. This is the new improved version. We've now added stripes. Okay, so, uh, so thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Questions? The uh, uh, inhibitor is particularly uh, potent on MIC targeting uh, transcriptional elongation. Uh, why it's so specific for uh, melanocytes? I thought uh, MIC would be, have some effect in the other proliferation. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that there's, there's two parts of this. So it's definitely neural crest genes and notch targets. So some people think MIC might be part of the notch pathway uh, or WIT pathway. You know, a lot of people um, have that thought. but. Um, the, we, in a separate story we had published in Cell in July, we had a similar story in blood uh, in the uh, hematopoietic stem cells and, and erythroid cells that the cell-specific transcription complex actually binds to the elongation complex. And so uh, our expectation is something like MITF itself or perhaps SOX10 it would give the neural crest specificity. We don't know what would give the MIC effect or the notch effect, and so. We would, but in theory, it would be some type of regulator that controls that pathway. So, Glenn, are, are you sure that <coughs> the effect of this drug has anything to do with your uridine, uh, uridylate pools? Yeah, so um, we're pretty sure that it does, but um, one of the things we tried to do was to rescue with uridylate, and unfortunately didn't work because we were, it was so toxic to the embryos that... Did, uh, you, did you try uridine itself? Yeah, I mean, uridine no, we did. Uridine is the transported, yeah. and it didn't work. It didn't work. But there are other pigment mutants that are also not rescued by uridine that are in this pathway, but it's pretty specific. So, uh, um, you know, I think that it's likely to be right, but we don't have the definitive evidence because yeah. the uridine wouldn't rescue. And is there any attempt now to try to refine the molecule to make it more potent and, and more specific? Yeah, so um, there's a couple companies who've made derivative chemicals. Uh, Sanofi is one of them that I, I think. And so um, we'd like to you know, work with the most active chemical we can and then put it into our model and see how it works. But uh, my view is that uh, this one is pretty good, but it probably could be better. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Fala? Len, I, I know your uh, theory about elongation as a, and posing as an important uh, step towards terminal differentiation. So if you were to take a, an inverse approach and ask yourself what are the elongation components, which are tissue specific, and uh, would you be able to drag them and would you be able to generalize these, uh, uh, not doing genetics, but now candidate gene or protein approach? Yeah. So. Um, so far, there isn't a cell-specific regulator of transcription elongation. And I think that in this uh, cell paper we had, it, it explains it in that things that are uh, the transcription factor complexes that are cell-specific are actually binding to the actual elongation machinery, conferring the cell specificity. So um, there may be, I mean, it's definitely true, for instance, in transcription initiation, Bob Tijan has found some really interesting cell-specific regulators. So it could be that they would be found, but so far to date, um, we haven't seen them. So um, I think it's this coupling of the intrinsic cell-specific machinery to the elongation machinery that's going to generate the specificity. I should also say that probably in every single tissue, this is happening. So um, for instance, it's known that myOD in a muscle will actually precipitate with PTFB and likely regulate elongation. And um, uh, this work would say in melanocytes, it's the same thing we have also in blood. So I think the cell specificity comes from the original master regulator. Oh, right, right, yes. To find out, that, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I, I don't know anything directly about how the chemistry would work to fashion this in a cell specific manner. But what's surprising is that this uridine deficiency, you know, we've looked at other organs in the embryo, and they're pretty much normal. So it seems to be very specific in embryogenesis for neural crest cells and maybe a couple other tissues. But it's, uh, so there is some specificity that's intrinsic, which we don't understand. Yeah, question on the side effects or toxicities of the double inhibition. I think this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you sacrifice the fish or, you know, do you do some studies, yeah. alteration of pathways or yeah. organ 
development? Yeah, so we've done that actually, and it's true that um, if you, um, in, particularly in the first story where we had the TPCK and we lowered the dose, we got a much less toxicity if you gave the combination. And uh, so I think that uh, we haven't evaluated toxicity perhaps in uh, BRAF and leflutamide. Leflutamide, in, at my understanding, is it, it has a toxicity of liver damage. That's one of its major toxicities, but otherwise is tolerated pretty well. So, uh, um, so again, um, I think looking at combinations and then being able to section the fish, look at pathology, is look at gene expression is, is certainly an option. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.